Hi, it's Tony Bruski from the Grave Talks. If you're liking this program, I invite you to become a Grave Keeper. That is a supporter of this program. You are the folks who will financially allow this show to continue going forward. $5 a month gets you access to advanced episodes of the show as I create them. Typically two, three, four, five, six, sometimes even more episodes in advance available exclusively for our Grave Keeper members. Plus, exclusive interview segments that are not going to be available to the public only to gravekeepers typically an extra 10 15 20 minutes of interview time with future guests of our show going forward it's exclusive content it's advanced content and it's only for gravekeepers who are helping to keep the show on the air it takes a tremendous amount of time every single week for me to put this show together get it up get it on the air uh, have it hosted bandwidth all of that and i love doing it but we do need to make sure it's financially viable in at least to support the costs of running this thing. So if you like the show, please consider becoming a gravekeeper through our website, thegravetalks.com or patreon.com slash thegravetalks. $5 a month, get advanced access and exclusive content as well to keep this show on the air. Thank you for your support. I hope you enjoy it just as much as I do. Check it out, thegravetalks.com or patreon.com slash thegravetalks. And thank you for your support. Today on The Grave Talks, the demon of Brownsville Road. As a young boy, Bob Cranmer would grow up being drawn to a certain house in his neighborhood. He didn't know why, but he knew he wanted to live there. Later in life, that dream came true, and he was able to call this unpractical 7,000-plus-square-foot house a home. Shortly after moving in, it became more than just another house. The dead and the demonic began to make themselves known. This house would eventually inspire the book The Demon of Brownsville Road. What started as small and seemingly insignificant events quickly turned into life-threatening attacks that require the involvement of the Catholic Church and renowned exorcists. Who or what was the demon of Brownsville Road? And how did it all begin for Bob? Well, it's a, uh, it's a very uh, impressive... Um, uh, what, what would be the good word? Uh, uh, Classical-looking Victorian... Uh, turn of the century house that uh, really grabs anybody's attention just in its setting it sits back uh, from from the main road has a rather large yard and some very impressive oak trees in front of it large white pillars on the front porch kind of reminds you of a a southern uh, uh, you know southern plantation type mansion you know and um, so it um, Everybody uh, knows the house, generally, who drives by it because it is very unique in its architecture. Uh, it was uh, uh, given a, um, uh, a brass plaque by the Pittsburgh uh, History and Landmarks Foundation before its unique architecture. So uh, it is a unique house just to look at. But my uh, my interest and fascination with it goes back to my earliest memories. I, I would suppose probably around when I was seven years old or so. Um, uh, and in uh, grade school, I had a couple friends that lived over on this side of town. And I would walk over to their houses and thus walk in front of the house. And uh, not a time I walked in front of the house, I didn't stop and just stare at it. It just seemed to be reaching out to me. I always wanted to go in it and uh, uh, was um, uh, very interested always in, in what it looked like inside and so on. Did you ever get a chance as a child to see the inside? Did you ever know who lived in the house? Uh, not really. I did not. I, I, didn't, I didn't really know who uh who owned it uh, obviously they were wealthy people and it turns out it was an, an attorney um who had it uh so i i never um 
I know one of the television programs that was done on this story shows me, you know, sneaking onto the porch and peering in one of the windows of the porch. But I, I never had the courage <laughs> to actually go up onto the porch or anything. But my fascination with it uh, continued on through my uh, teenage years uh, to the point that when I was looking after having moved away from Pittsburgh. When I graduated from college, I was gone for 10 years and in the military and was looking to move back here with my young family. Uh, not particularly planning to move back to the same little town I grew up in. Uh, and my mother told me, uh, surprisingly enough, she said, oh, by the way, you'll, you'll be happy to hear that your house is going on the market. And when she said, your house, I knew immediately what she meant because she knew what house in town fascinated me the most. When you found out that information, did what was your reaction? Did you did it go to a thought process of, wow, now maybe I should go back here? Was it like, well, that's a childhood dream. I've moved on from that. What was your, your next gut reaction when you found that information? My, out? my next gut reaction was instant. It was, well, I'm going to buy that house. That was it. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was no question in my mind. My wife had, had uh, a number of other houses lined up. Uh, for us to look at Mm -hmm. but for me it was just kind of a cursory thing to do routine after we went to the house and looked at it uh, I I had it in my mind that I was going to buy that house now my wife didn't agree she didn't particularly care for the house not that there was she felt uh, she, she just felt it, it wasn't the house for us I mean you have this 7500 square foot mini mansion uh uh, you know, we, we don't even have enough furniture for the first floor. And rightly so, she said, what, why in the world would we want a house like this? First of all, how old it is and how big it is. We, we don't we need like a normal house, not this thing. But uh, that that fell on death. That, those protests fell on deaf ears as far as as I was concerned. When you got to the house for the first time with the realtor to see the house, obviously you have a lot of thoughts. You have a a lot of anticipation built up here throughout your whole life. Having just seen the outside, you open the door, you walk in. What's going through your mind? How are you feeling about now having this question answered of what this house looks and feels like inside? Well, it, it met all of my expectations and then some. And, um, For those that, one, you know, I grew up in a normal, small, you know, three-bedroom, normal house, um, two-story. When you walk into one of these old Victorian houses with the 10-foot ceilings and the large open rooms and, you know, the large foyer, and you look up and there's a balcony above you from the second floor looking down and chandeliers and so on you know it kind of gives you the feeling you're walking into a big ship mm-hmm. you know this the uh it, it just was an overwhelming feeling to walk into the house I, I i can remember how my wife and i felt uh now that feeling obviously um uh, abated and, and went away over the years after we lived there but walking into this kind of big cavernous place to begin with was certainly impressive and it met all my expectations as far as what it looked like and the oak woodwork and the large staircase uh it just reeked of history and i can remember thinking you know uh uh things like uh you know what people were in this house discussing the sinking of the titanic they were here talking about the uh, the beginning of World War One and, and uh, all of the history and, the, and during the Depression and World War Two and all the history that took place and thought if these walls could only talk and uh, I'm fixated on history and it just enveloped me completely and I felt um, I'm going to bring all that back and I'm going to um, you know make this my domain and you know when you I looked at uh, you know, the servant's staircase and the servant's bell in the dining room and so on. And remember the grandeur of 
of those days. It, it was all that much more impressive, and it just it just melted melded right in with my personality and my my interest in history. Once you were there, going through the house and showing it to your family, you know your wife had some reservations there. Was was there any reservations with you? Was there any feelings that had come about of the home other than this is the perfect home for us? Uh, there were no reservations. I, I, you know, as far as being the perfect home, I kind of knew it wasn't. Okay. <laughs> you know that it was. Uh, you know, it was going to be a lot of money. Uh, it needed, you know, it had 46 windows in it, all needing replaced, if not more, because we didn't replace them all. And, uh, you know, it, it, the, the furnace and uh, all of these things needed to be updated. Um, but that really didn't make any difference to me. I was just convinced that fate had determined that this was to be my house and that's why the owners decided to sell it uh at the same time i was moving back to pittsburgh with a new job and a promotion and uh a bunch of money in my pocket from selling a house uh, uh that we had just built uh, when i worked in new jersey so I felt everything came together at the same time. I had always wanted this house. I had always wanted to go into it. And here you go. I'm coming back, and my house is waiting for me. And uh, I, I just thought that was all some type of predetermined plan. And in the end, I believe it was. Now, for much different reason. Um, but uh, And I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, and uh, had I... Uh, most likely would have done something else, but nonetheless, that's what happened. So fate calls the house of your dreams is there, practical or not practical as it may be. You get to the house, you you buy the house, and then you start moving in. How does that go? Is there anything? Like, what is your first sign that maybe there's more that's coming with this house other than you know the feeling of history being there? Well, the first thing that happened, and, and, and certainly my wife added to this, and she was more practical at the time when we were, one of the times we were, I think we had already agreed to buy it, and, and they were giving us more of a tour of the house, and we were in the basin, basement looking at this giant old gas furnace that dated back to the late, I would suppose, 1940s. And um, my my wife, noticed that our three-year-old son was no longer with us and she was concerned where you know where where'd he disappear to so she and the woman of the house uh, the wife of the, the owners you know um, headed up the steps to find our little boy and they came across Tim on the landing halfway up the um, the steps to the second floor uh, breathing uh, hard and shaking and um, initially just thinking he was scared because he had he had gotten lost but uh, he had apparently started venturing up to the second floor and something stopped him and my wife found it interesting that the woman uh, reached out to him and said oh honey did you, did you see something <laughs> did you see something and my wife thought, that's interesting, what, what would he have seen? And uh, later, that prompted to her to tell me, you know, this house gives me the creeps. There's something not right about this house. I don't like it. And uh, I think uh, rather than us buying it, it's kind of swallowing us up. And uh, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable with the house. Were you writing it off as... You know, kids get into things, they just kind of, they feel this or that. Did you personally at that moment put any legitimacy behind it thinking, well, maybe he did see something? You know, I, I didn't, but I did ask the homeowner. Uh, I said to him, and, and I detail this in the book, I, I, I said, uh, is there anything wrong with this house? Mm -hmm. And you would think that he would take that question as being something wrong structurally or you know, mechanically with, with the house and asked me to define it. Um, but he knew right away what I meant. 
his reaction was quick and and direct and he said there's nothing wrong with the house in fact we've had uh, a priest say mass in the living room twice um which in a way was some reassurance but then i even questioned having been raised catholic i was not catholic at the time but i said who has mass said in their house mass isn't something that's like taken on the road it's said in a in a church so it was an interesting response uh which later in later years i would come to understand more and more when because we had mass not only in the living room but in the bedrooms and the third floor in the basement uh more times than i could count uh saying mass in the house became one of our weapons when you found out that mass had been said there was that where it was left did you have any inclination of maybe i should contact the church and ask why they're having mass in the house or or maybe i should have been more sure i guess at the time he qualified that by saying oh two of my sons had their first communion yeah in the living room and 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 i and i what i thought was well these are irish catholics maybe they have some type of irish tradition that i'm not aware of but who has their first communion in their house well uh, they probably were young children at the time. I, you know, my children who were not Catholic had their first communion in the house too because we had mass in the house and we all took Catholic communion. Sure. Um, and um, that was unique. Uh, and I think uh, overrode uh, rules and traditions of the church because of the situation where we were having mass in the house to combat an evil situation and that was the same I'm sure uh, that was the case with this previous family and uh, the, you know later in months to come I would find a small metal box buried in the front yard uh, as I was planting flowers I would open it and find Catholic medals and little holy objects inside it I'd question the previous owner again and his response at that point was please just put the box back where you found it <laughs> and uh later would come to understand that burying burying blessed objects in, at the four corners of a of a property um or a building that is plagued in some way with evil is another Catholic tradition, and that's what they did. So apparently these folks had attempted to, you know, they had initiated and taken action to combat what was in the house, and probably uh, after a while, when it didn't work, just decided we're going to we're going to get out of here. Sure. And that's what I think then prompted them to take my first offer, which really surprised me because it was a, a, at least, as I recall, $20,000 less than what I was prepared to pay. And they accepted it without question because they just wanted out. So you're in the house now. You start to look around. You start to see things. You're finding these these metals in the garden and those boxes. Are you having any any experiences in the house initially? Well, by that time, <clears throat> we moved in in December, uh, bought the house uh, in November, moved in December. Uh, it wasn't uh, two or three weeks. Uh, the, the incident with the, uh, with the metal box occurred later the next year in the spring. So I, I had already experienced, um, I wouldn't say significant, but paranormal activity incidents had already begun and not become yet not yet routine but uh had taken place the, f the first incident that took place that that uh, gave my wife and i pause uh was um a uh a, a, a coat closet underneath the main staircase uh a light in that coat closet uh that uh, had a a pull chain to turn it off and on uh and uh i would uh, 
go into that closet where I kept my overcoat. It was winter time, and I would find the chain uh, wrapped around the top of the light. When I'd reach in to, to to find the chain to pull pull it to turn on the light, so I could see in the closet. I could never find the chain, and um, I. Surmised that my wife, uh, who also kept the vacuum in that closet, uh, in turning the light off, was just pulling on the chain, and it would fly up, uh, you know, uh, as a as a uh, you know reaction to letting it go quickly. And so I asked her not to do that. Um, upon which time she said, "I'm not. I I know how to pull a chain to turn the light on." So we decided to conduct an experiment. And one morning as I was going to work, we both were at the door. I said, okay, I put my coat on, turned the light out. We both observed the chain hanging straight at the light, closed the door. I said, don't go in there the rest of the day. I came home that evening and we opened the door, reached in and the chain wasn't there. It was wrapped around the light. So at that point in time, we both knew conclusively that there was something I may have sit in the house, that there was some type of a spirit. Uh, the children couldn't have done, done it. Our, our oldest at the time was four years old, and this light was a good six feet off the, from the floor. Uh, never could have reached it, nor would have ever had reason to. Um, so we knew at that point in time there was something odd with the house. Um, subsequent to that, uh, things like coming down in the morning and all the lights being on, uh, water running in the sink, um, the, the radio turned on in the basement. I, I had a radio in my workshop in the basement. All the time I would go down there and the radio would already be turned on. So just little strange things like that, which just led us to believe, well, there's some type of a ghost in the house. But as long as we, you know, it, 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 it didn't seem to be malevolent or dangerous and we'll just coexist with it. It sounds like you already had an attitude of ghosts are out there. It doesn't sound like it was like some foreign concept or that you were in denial that this sort of thing happens. Is that right? Well, I can't say that I had ever had one any interest or any experience in dealing with anything uh, extraordinary or you know paranormal or mm -hmm. ghostly. I, I never, certainly, you know, heard ghost stories and seen movies and so on. But it was clearly long before the big paranormal craze as there is going on now, and. Um, I had no real interest, neither my wife or I had ever had any experience with a ghost. Um, we just determined, though, when we see this happening, that, well, uh, there's something going on here that defies explanation. And um, I did tell my mother about it. She was Catholic, and she arranged for a priest from the, her local parish to come to the house and conduct a house blessing, which I thought, ah, this will probably take care of it. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't, <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, yeah, we did. I did come to a, um, uh, you know, determination that yeah, there's something going on in this house. Now, was it enough for us? to say, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to get out of here. I'm going to sell this house of my dreams. No, not at all. But I was concerned. Believe me, I was concerned. At what point did the, the, the kind of just small things, the, the water turning on and off, chains and things, the, the, the non-threatening uh, course of events turn to being, I'm going from I'm concerned to I'm really concerned. Really concerned. We need to do yeah. something here. Well, I, I, I would say that <clears throat> oh, through the years, um, all of that somewhat uh, non-threatening stuff continued, um, I'm, I'm talking 10 years. Uh, our kids uh, were no longer um, little, you know, they became adolescents and eventually teenagers. Um, <clears throat> we all knew about it. We all had our own experiences, uh, some more so than others. Um, images were seen, faces were seen. It was getting a little bit more concerning. But at the same time, 
my family all those years was undergoing really I think some serious psychological issues uh, and our family was very dysfunctional my kids fought an awful lot my kids fought with me um, and I didn't initially associate that dysfunction with this spirit um, I, I really didn't have reason to it wasn't until later on that we moved in the house you know 19 late, late 18 in 1980 so 1989 it wasn't for over 10 years that things really before before the stuff hit the fan so to speak where it became openly uh, dangerous uh, and 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 uh, uh, malevolent and threatening um, but after that started to happen then I could look back and I could see uh, how this spirit was in fact um, playing a role in in the family and the family's development and so on and, <clears throat> and and it all started to come together things started to make sense but up until that point, I really didn't realize it, uh, nor really should I have. Um, but when it became openly threatening and, and, and demonstrating that it, it wanted to hurt us, that was a different story. Do you feel that the, the dysfunction that was going on was brought on by the spirit or was negative energy feeding basically existing dysfunction that, that occurs in, in most families through some of those formative years? No, I believe uh, that it it was it was working on us. Um, I mean, when you're you're when we eventually discovered not only how evil this thing was, and also how powerful it was because of its ability to resist. Uh, that living with something like this in the house, um, that it's it's malevolence, that it's evil, that its intentions certainly had an impact on all of us in different ways. I mean, here in 1996, my wife at the time was, um, let's see, how old was she? Uh, 34 years old, um, has like a complete mental breakdown and has to spend two weeks in a psychiatric hospital. Um, it was, it was, uh, you know, there were things going on yeah. uh, that were impacting us. I mean, two of my children later had to spend time in, in psychiatric hospitals and be on medication. And to see how they are now, uh, it was clearly a result of living with this malevolent evil spirit. No question in my mind. What was the first moment where you or your family felt threatened in that house? What was the incident? Well, the incident that took place that alarmed me the most was um, it, it involved my, my son. He was in his bedroom uh, one day after school, and uh, he heard in the corner uh, of his room away from him, and again, this is a large, large bedroom, uh, a, 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 like a, a pop, like... Um, not not a firecracker, but kind of like a, an air pop, pop, like an air gun being shot. Sure. And something whizzed by his head and, and hit, hit the wall right past him. And here he comes to, to discover what it was, was a, a music CD that had flown across the room and smashed into the wall. Now you might you might know, think, okay, um, how could that be really dangerous? Now everyone's familiar with a with a compact disc. If I took one, they're pretty durable. I mean, even to take one and break one in half wouldn't wouldn't be easy. And I think I could even take one and throw it against a, a brick wall, and it probably would only crack yeah. or chip. Uh, this particular CD hit a plaster wall with such velocity that it it smashed like a plate would if you threw it on a concrete on the on a 
concrete surface. It was in shards. The plastic was just in shards, uh, and you could hold it in hand. There was no shape of a disc anymore. It was just shredded plastic. Um, had that hit him, uh, it would have caused him serious damage, and you know, if it hit him in the head, it, it may have killed him. Uh, when that happened, and I saw the remains of that, uh, and I heard how it happened. Uh, that's when I became very concerned that this is uh, this thing is out to hurt us, and it just missed hitting him. And uh, that's when I decided that, I, that something had to be done. What did you do? What was your first steps uh, after that incident occurred? As a father, being concerned for your your son and your family and their safety, what did you do next? Yeah, good good question. You know, who are you going to call? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, who are you going to call? Um, that was, again, before there were uh, uh, paranormal investigators. I'm getting feedback on this. I don't know what the problem is. I'm not hearing anything. Yeah, I can hear my voice coming back. I'm not huh. sure. I, I, I haven't changed anything over here. <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you, I, 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 this isn't the first time that um, there's problems when I when I do interviews. Really? Uh, I, I, I did hear one recently for an hour, and when we got done, there was no interview on the tape. Okay. Now it's stopped now. Okay. I said, it's just stopped, but uh, it happens all the time when I'll do interviews, and there'll be electric malfunction, and and uh, once I did an hour long. Uh, interview at a radio station in Philadelphia again when we got done there was nothing on the tape so <laughs> just to warn you I, um, you're not alone I've, I've actually I had an incident of, and I've heard stories years ago of George Lutz uh, having very similar difficulties trying to get interviews out uh, before he passed from George Lutz yeah I just yeah. redid an interview here recently because uh, when I had done it a number of months ago, and and this guy has very sophisticated equipment, he had it all checked out and could not find any rational explanation as to why uh, it didn't record. He had checked everything, double checked everything before the interview went off, and when he was done, there was nothing. So, anyway, um, to answer your question, uh, it was before. Uh, there were, you know, you watch these television programs now and this investigator comes in or this team, every city, every community has some type of a group that claims to know how to deal with this stuff. But at that time, there was nothing. And having been, I was not in office anymore, but I had been a fairly, a very prominent local politician. I was chairman of the board of the Allegheny County Commissioners. Um, and uh, I was close friends with, at that point in time, the gentleman who was mayor. He was still mayor of the city of Pittsburgh. And um, a, a few folks, close friends, knew uh, I was having issues, and I told him about this. And he said, I will go see the bishop, uh, Bishop Whirl, uh, later Cardinal Whirl, uh, the Catholic Diocese of Pittsburgh. And he went and explained to him that I was had been experiencing these issues with the house, and then the Catholic diocese got involved and eventually committed uh, to work uh, with us in it. And you know, having seen the movie The Exorcist, I know that the Catholic Church um, claims to you know have a have a handle on on the spiritual. Uh, world and evil entities and things like that. So uh, I thought that they would come to the house with, you know, incense uh, uh, dispensers in hand and holy water and so on and do what they would do and fix the problem and leave. Uh, I didn't know that it would be such a long and protracted battle uh, that would take several years to uh, to. Uh, deal with the issue. When you first reached out to them, were they receptive to investigating this, or how did they take it? Well, I must say, when the mayor of the city <laughs> comes to see you, <laughs> and they obviously knew who I was, um, 
just from my my political uh, notoriety. So they they knew I wasn't a kook or anything. Mm -hmm. And um, it was interesting, though, uh, when the representative from the diocese initially called me on the phone. Uh, it, It was very mysterious. He seemed to know a lot more about the situation than I even knew. And I thought, well, is he working for some for some kind of a record here, some kind of, of a file? And uh, he's told me at the time, he said, you have two options. The first option being is like the previous owners, sell the house, move away, and, and pass it off and forget about it. Or if you want to attempt to deal with the issue, we will help you. We cannot guarantee success. This is not going to be easy. And he said, in a year, a year from now, if we decide that we're going to battle this or cleanse it, we'll know if we're making any progress a year from now. And I thought, what do you mean a year from now? Can't you just come and, you know, say some Latin prayers and... Do what they do on TV. Yeah. <laughs> take care of it. Yeah. You know, like calling, calling the, you know, the roto rooter guy to come <laughs> and clean your drains out. Um, no, it wasn't going to be that easy. And in fact, uh, a year after that point, um, it was very uh, difficult. And it seemed like we had not made any progress. In fact, it seemed a year from that point that the spirit was ready to drive us out of the house. It was that bad. That concludes part one of our interview with Bob Cranmer about the demon of Brownsville Road. In part two, we'll ask Bob what he did to protect his family after his son was almost seriously hurt in his room by unforeseen forces. How did the Catholic Church become involved with the home, and why did they get involved with the exercising of demons from this home? What did the church already know about the house before they told Bob they were going to get involved? Why did some priests and ministers refuse to come to exercise the home. What was the dark history of the home that made it an ideal cage for a demon? And was there ever any physical harm done to the family from the demonic entities residing there? Also, did Bob and his family ever find peace in the house? We'll answer all of that in part two. You can hear it when you become a gravekeeper through our website at thegravetalks.com or patreon.com slash thegravetalks. You'll have access to every single part two of our interviews of The Grave Talks, as well as advanced episodes of our program released months before they go public. If you want more episodes and the exciting conclusion to this episode, please become a gravekeeper for $5 a month on our website, thegravetalks.com, through our link to Patreon at patreon.com slash thegravetalks. Until next time, for The Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.